Hi, this is Professor Robbins, and I'm back again to talk to you about polarity. Uh, last week we talked about, I gave you a checklist of kind of ways to go through a text. Polarity is another way of approaching a text, and I like to teach polarity to new literature students because it's kind of not easy, that's not the right word, but it's a little easier just because it taps into something that everybody uses all the time, and that's opposites. Um, we were taught opposites, think about even as early as like Sesame Street, an early kids book of Dr. Seuss played the idea of opposites. In literature, opposites really help us understand characters, theme, things like setting, so it's something that you should already be already know and have some prior knowledge of and that should be very helpful to you in understanding how to understand a story. So let me switch over to screen share and pull up the lecture. All right, so let's talk about polarity and its other term, which is binary oppositions. Polarity in literature is really going to help to understand things like conflict when characters um, are against each other, connections, how they're similar and how they're different, and then contradictions or discrepancies, multiple angles. So what is polarity? Well, by definition, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, polarity is the quality of exhibiting opposite or contrasted properties or powers in opposite or contrasted directions, the state of having two opposite or contradictory tendencies, opinions, or aspects. Uh, I flagged all the words that mean opposite and, and contrast, and hopefully what you've picked up on is the thing you need to know most about this definition, the most important part of this definition, is it's just the study of opposites. That it's really really all kind of polarity boils down to is it's when things um, are reversed or in opposition are contrasted or at its bare basics are opposites. We see opposites in day to day. Think about night versus day um, and how we give meaning to night as dreamy, as mysterious, sometimes as dangerous, um, and how we code day as being active, imaginative. Um, enterprising, uh, alert, on all those things are part of the ways we define night by how we define day, and we define day by how we define night. Think about hot and cold, uh, fire, water. These are just kind of basic oppositions and basic opposites and polarities we see. Uh, Fire tends to be attached to warm colors, um, cold and water get attached to blues and cooler temperatures. Even take something basic like the yin yang symbol, which has its origins in Japanese philosophy and religion. The idea that we could put all of these things as polars, as opposites, negative versus positive, female, male, night, day, passive, active, moon, sun, intuitive, logical, cold, hot, soft, hard. Uh, there's a way in which we just attach, we almost break down everything in our lives into a series of opposites to understand how the things connect. The role of the polarity is, especially in literature, means that I understand something because I understand what it is being compared to. It's like this, um, it's not like this, but like that. That sounds hypothetical, but it really makes more sense if I could give you an example. I know what's considered beautiful because I know what's considered ugly. And I know what's considered ugly because I know what's considered beautiful. So if I showed you a picture, you would probably understand the ugly one because of what you, the rules you have about what's considered beautiful. Polarity and oppositions are ever adjusting. They change by culture change over time, and change by extremes. Um, when I'm teaching symbolism, I also tell, often tell students about if you go to America, you will expect to see the bride in white. But if a bride showed up to white at a wedding in India, she'd get in a lot of trouble because white is the color you wear to a funeral. So here I have white in terms of an interesting polarity. White in a 
in America is a color of purity and white in India is the color of attached to death. We would wear black to a funeral or they'd wear white to a funeral. So polarities and opposites can change by culture. They can change over time. What's considered beautiful now may not be beautiful in a hundred years. In early modern England they used to um, try to paint their teeth black because if your teeth were black that meant you were eating a lot of sugar um, which meant you were very very wealthy and could afford sugar so black teeth were considered beautiful black teeth would be considered really ugly right now they can also change by extremes there's a difference between like a little bit good really good really really good so you can also play polarities by the degree to which they're opposites to give you another example of this look at something like good and evil what we consider to be good is continually changing. Um, what we consider to be evil is continually changing. Good and evil can change by cultures. You can also be, like I said, a little bit good and a little bit evil. You can also be extremely evil and extremely good. So in thinking about something as basic about good and evil in a story, we would play the degrees to which they fit one or the other, and then we'd try to think about what is being, how good and evil is being defined at that moment in the text um, and thinking about how the two are set up in contradiction. There's also polarity in our everyday lives. Think about all the fights we have about men and women because we've decided to, in our rules of polarity and binary opposition, pretend that men are opposite to women. I got this just off the internet to kind of illustrate how we think about men and women as being inherently opposites. And this has caused a lot of trouble in terms of issues of equality and feminist debate and all those kinds of things because we like to play think the gender are opposites when probably truth be told we're really not so opposite. Um, even a, this is an example of a color wheel that places all of these emotions as polars. Joy is the exact opposite of sadness. Boredom is the exact opposite of kind of thinking about excitement. There's anticipation and surprise are a little bit in opposition. So we think about even Van Gogh believed that blue and yellow were the perfect colors for painting. If you think about his starry night, you can see that blue and yellow. And that's because those are opposites on a color wheel, so they would lend balance to the picture. Just as another example, I've got your brain. Your brain is divided into your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere, and people always talk about being left-brained or right-brained. We've even put our bodies in opposition, my left hand versus my right hand. Think of all the sayings that say, your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. You've played polars within your own body of believing your left hand, what it's doing, is somewhat contradictory to what your right hand would be doing. In your brain, left brain people tend to be logical, analytical, reason, deductive, science. Right brain people tend to like poetry and art and be passionate and creative. Um, and those beliefs about the opposite sides of our brains and that our brains do something different is based on science. This is a scientific fact about brain functioning, but it suggests that even our brain is divided into polars, logical versus creative, analytical versus um, kind of intuitive. So our brains are even examples of polars. In families, uh, we think about polarities and mothers and daughters. Um, I'm listening to the book by Deborah Tannen about that's called You're Wearing That and it's about how the conversation styles between women and daughters. For instance, when a mother says, do you like your hair long like that? A mother, I and mean, a daughter, sorry, if a mother says, do you like, do you, asks, do you like your hair long like that? A daughter <laughs> might hear that as an accusation that she did, her mother doesn't actually like her hair. Um, and so even in families, sometimes we think about mothers and daughters being similar. What that question is about is thinking about the angle in which 
kind of the angle in which this is one of my phones going off and I'm trying to pretend like it's not happening. <laughs> but I might as well acknowledge it if you can hear it. Um, there's a way in which mothers get to be associated with uh, parenting, security, stability. Uh, their daughters are in some respects reflections of them because they are also the females. But think of all the times in movies and shows daughters are put as opposites from their mothers and they create a kind of polar opposition. The getting back to Tan and the idea of asking do you like your hair like that sometimes gets thought about in the sense of a mother wanting to look out for her daughter because she knows how hard it is to be judged on appearance so it's a way of being protective but as a daughter can play the polar opposite of that a feeling like she's not making her mother happy or living up to her standards so think about it in your head and just kind of start listing them out all the similarities between mothers and daughters and all the differences and you can see how we would even have mothers roles as somewhat similar and somewhat different. We do the same thing with fathers and sons. Um, we think about fathers as roles of protector, provider. Um, sons and sometimes develop issues with fathers because they also want to be like them but sometimes they also want to be not like them. This is what happens with mothers and daughters too that you may want to be like your mother but you may also not want to be like your mother. In fathers and sons you can see the angle of um, the role of provider, uh, the role of hero. What if eventually though the father slips a little bit and isn't the hero role? What will that mean for sons? So I can play a lot about basic polarities even within family structures. So I think I'm going to keep this one just a nice short polar le lecture about what is the definition of polarity and you can watch part two to understand how polarity plays a role in literature and film. So let me go back to my Google Hangout. Sorry about the phone call in the middle, um, which you probably can hear because I have my microphone on, but it distracted me, so it just threw me off a little. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this one, and then you can watch part two to understand polarity in literature. And that one I'll take it more beyond the angle of polars as opposites. And polarity, again, literally just means understanding how things are put in oppositions or made opposites of each other. And I'll show you why that's so meaningful in literature. So see you soon.